Options in Psychology, and um, I specialize in early childhood, um, infant, toddler, preschool, um, mostly 10 and under is my practice. Um, <clears throat> I'm also a member, a board member of the uh, Nebraska Association of Infant Mental Health. Um, I've been doing that since we started in about 2006, and I'm currently the board president. Um, this is our first adventure with uh, webinars, and um, glad to see so many of you join us. And I, I hope you'll find these helpful, and um, we we want to continue them if they'll be uh, effective and meaningful for for people. Um, our general topic tonight is just generally what is infant, toddler, early childhood mental health, um, and so. Um, we'll just kind of walk you through um, what that is. I don't know why the rest of that isn't coming up. Oh. Okay, well, our, my general plan is to kind of talk for about 60 minutes. Um, if you have questions along the way, feel free to use the chat window. Um, if something uh, strikes me, I'll respond to it immediately. If not, we'll kind of categorize and collect those and stop um, along the way and for sure at the end and entertain questions. So feel free to ask questions. Um, I think I'm going to have some trouble with some of my slides. I want to talk about this idea of how we're hardwired for relationships. Um, from the moment of birth, children begin to soak up and absorb the world around them. Um, and neurons that fire together, wire together, the connections that begin to form uh, begin in, in very early interactions. Um, there's this idea of mirror neurons, um, and I want to show you a clip of an infant that's 10 minutes old. We'll just kind of talk about this a little bit. Xavier, Xavier, hello, hello. Only 10 minutes old, Xavier's infant senses are bombarded with new sights, sounds, and feelings. Good boy. He watches his father pull faces and then slowly responds. This isn't conscious mimicry. Xavier doesn't even know he has a face. But he's managing to translate what he sees into similar actions of his own. Hello. Ah. Copy Daddy. I really like that clip as an example of um, why the baby is responding is because of this idea of mirror neurons. And every moment matters, and um, th there's very significant interactions that happen. And the Harvard um, people call this serve and return interactions. Uh, the, the baby and young child gives us some kind of cue, and we respond to those. There's a serve and return, and there's this wonderful back and forth interaction that happens. Um, I want to show you the still face. This is Edtronic's research and um, they have the mom do this playful interaction um, with the baby and then they have her put on a still face um, for about a minute to a minute and a half to two minutes and you see the reactions and the strategies that the infant uses to pull mom back Babies this young are extremely responsive to 
the emotions and the reactivity and the social interaction that they get from the world around them. This is something that we started studying oh, 30, 40 years ago when people didn't think that infants could engage in social interaction. In the still face experiment, what the mother did was she sits down and she's playing with her baby who's about a year of age. I'm like a girl. Oh. And she gives a greeting to the baby, the baby gives a greeting back to her. Yeah. Yeah. This baby starts pointing at different places in the world and the mother's trying to engage her and play with her. They're working to coordinate their emotions and their intentions, what they want to do in the world. And that's really what the baby is used to. And then we ask the mother to not respond to the baby. The baby very quickly picks up on this and then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back. She smiles at the mother, she points because she's used to the mother looking where she points. Yeah. The baby puts both hands up in front of her and says, what's happening here? She makes that screechy sound at the mother, like, come on, why aren't we doing this? Even in this two minutes when they don't get the normal reaction, they react with negative emotions, they turn away, they feel the stress of it, they actually may lose control of their posture because of the stress that they're experiencing. It's a little like the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good is that normal stuff that goes on, that we all do with our kids. The bad is when something bad happens, but the infant can overcome it. After all, when you stop the still face, the mother and the baby start to play again. The ugly is when you don't give the child any chance to get back to the good is no reparation and they're stuck in that really ugly situation. So that that sets the stage for us to think about how important um, the interactions between parents and children are, um, how important it is for us to be aware of all of those moments, whether we're parents, early childhood educators, mental health practitioners, nurses, doctors, because when, when we watch those interactions, we can understand how precious they are and begin to help support parents, um, young parents, older parents, um, because there's so much uh, wonderful new information that we can share to help us understand um, what, what is a healthy relationship? And the neuroscience has really supported lots of things we've known intuitively for a long time. But neurons that fire together wire together. The brain's a use-dependent organ. Um, so babies that don't get talked to, their language skills don't develop as well. Um, babies that don't get held um, develop a uh, sometimes tactile sensitivity because they don't get held as well um, or they but yet they long for and still have a need um, to have those kinds of things met so what is early uh, mental health um, I like to call it the three R's it's about relationships um, relationships and relationships um, and there's so many um, kinds of things that support that. It's the social, emotional, and cognitive well-being of infants and toddlers. Infants and toddler, infant and toddler mental health is uh, synonymous with social, emotional well-being that results when infants and toddlers are supported by nurturing relationships. And one of the things, when you look at this uh, photo, um, as you notice the eye contact, 
uh, the wonderful shared delight between the two of them. Um, and it, even though it's a one-dimensional uh, photo, two-dimensional photo, we still have our own emotional response to that. Our own mirror, mirror neurons pull for that, and we see the joy and delight in that, and we begin to react to that ourselves. Um, very wonderful process that happens. Huh. So there's this idea of needing developmental support, um, particularly birth to three, because of this. Uh, babies are born with, you know, billions of neurons, and those neurons that get stimulated develop nice branching. Uh, the ends of the neurons develop the dendritic branching, and there's a nice deep um, density in the brains that happen. Um, Babies have, they're, they're dependent on their caregivers to take care of them, to help them soothe and, and regulate their emotions. Um, the relationship is strengthened through stress and stress reduction and that repeated process that happens over and over thousands of times. Um, so this infant mental health thing is linked to those experiences and the ability to regulate and express emotions to form close and secure interpersonal relationships, um, to support their exploration of the environment. <clears throat> As they begin to be able to move, they move away from the parents who are uh, their secure base, and they can move out, but then they come back um, to get their emotional cup filled up. And we welcome them back to just give them comfort, or if they're upset, um, they need some help uh, organizing their feelings and becoming more regulated again. Um, so this is all in the context of family and community and then each family's own cultural um, expectations for their young children. There's another uh, wonderful parent-child interaction. You can see the daddy looking at the baby and the baby responding with great delight. So infants experience this full range of human emotions, but they do it with our support, and they do it in the context of this serve and return uh, back and forth reciprocal interactions. Um, initially, they depend very heavily on adults to help them regulate, but over time they're able to do that more and more on their own because they've had our support and, and they're able to do that. And yet, <clears throat> we know that even as children grow and develop, they're going to be dysregulated, they're going to get upset, and they still need our help and support to be able to get it back together, to figure that out, to help, I, I love the phrase, organize their feelings, which is from the circle of security parenting model. Um, but to help them understand the story of what, what's going on, um, of course you're up said, I just told you you couldn't have candy until you um, have your dinner, or you can't eat dessert until you eat your mashed potatoes and gravy or whatever it is. Um, they can, with our support, increasingly uh, monitor their, their selves, their, their sense of self. Um, So when does mental health begin? It begins at, at birth. Um, it begins at conception. We know there's been an, uh, research that shows how the mom holds the baby in mind in, as a fetus is predictive of the attachment relationship at 12 months. Um, that state of mind, the parent's reflective capacity, already they begin to have that falling in love experience with the baby in the womb. They talk to them, they sing to them, the daddy uh, gets involved when all of those wonderful processes are in place.
And those experiences set the stage for the, for the rest of the child's life. Um, if they have those healthy expectations of, I can go explore the world and I know I'll be safe because somebody's there watching over me. And when I come back, um, just need to get some comfort. I get welcomed in and, and I feel safe and secure. Um, or if I'm upset, um, they're not going to react and yell at me, but I'm going to be able to be able to calm down and have a safe and secure base from which to, um, to get my needs met. So an infant who experiences poor mental health early in life becomes vulnerable across the lifespan. Um, and so we've learned that babies, infants, are significantly impacted by trauma. Trauma changes all of us. And when children are exposed to various kinds of trauma, um, it's significantly impactful for them. Uh, community violence, family violence, child maltreatment kinds of things. Um, physical abuse, um, natural disasters, fires, um, Uh, exposure to domestic violence is quite significant and impactful for children. We often think that they don't, um, they're not impacted by it or that they were asleep and yet the research shows that they're hiding around the corners, they're under their beds, they hear the cries, they hear the yelling, they hear the screaming, they, um, they're hiding in the closets for fear. Um, they come down, they see the results of mom's face later. Um, and it's very impactful for them. They sometimes see their parents arrested in situations like that or in situations where there's drug and alcohol. This is an example, a photo from a house where methamphetamines was being made. Um, we know that a lot of kids are exposed to violence in their communities, in their homes, and their, there's guns in the homes and in the neighborhoods, and young children are exposed to that. Um, we also know that there's a number of children that have significant medical needs and they have many, many needles. They have to go under anesthesia. Um, different hospitals are better about having parents there until the child goes under anesthesia and being there when they wake up. Um, what happens, that's really scary and traumatic for kids to have the world just disappear and then to wake up and see incredibly unfamiliar uh, faces, and so if mom or dad can be there with them, that can help prevent a lot of um, traumatic kinds of things. Exposure to media. There's been research that shows even though children aren't watching TV, <clears throat> they're constantly tuned in to that noise, um, and certain things pull them in, and with um, just the, all the stuff that's on the news and different things that are on shows, we now know that children are significantly impacted even when they're not directly watching all of those different kinds of things that are happening. So the earlier we can be involved and help uh, have a, shine some light on these things um, helps prevent problems from happening over the long haul. There's a strong link between children's trauma symptoms and the amount of exposure they've had to trauma symptoms. Um, the longer and, and more often they're exposed, the worse off the child will be socially, emotionally, and psychologically in the long run. Um, interventions and supports um, can address immediate needs and then long-term developmental needs as well. Um, the longer we wait uh, to recognize and respond, the more likely there'll be an adverse impact for kids. So who's watching? Developmental structures are incorporated, early developmental structures, they set the stage for later life. They're incorporated um, so that early competence tends to foster later competence and early incompetence tends to promote uh, later incompetence. So the impact of, of early trauma, uh, it affects child development. It, uh, in terms of behavior and relationships, it, it affects brain development. Um, and when undetected and untreated, it impacts both in the short term and long term, but not only um, social, emotional, mental health kinds of things, but we now know that 
people that have lots of multiple early um, adverse experiences have physical problems over the lifespan. Um, so it's really important that we seek to um, detect these kinds of things early as we possibly can. So I'll just read you a few of these. For some reason, my the PowerPoint's not putting up all the things, but um, trauma symptoms, things we'll see in kids that are having difficulties. This re-experiencing, playing out, we'll see trauma play where they actually play out different kinds of things. They may have toileting problems, sleep problems, eating problems. They'll have speech and language delays. Uh, we'll see kids that experience trauma regress um, to earlier stages of development. They may withdraw. They'll have um, the onset of new fears that aren't typical childhood anxiety or fears and, and uh, things that we don't usually see. Um, There'll be aggressive change in emotional regulation difficulties, increased clingingness, problems with separation. Um, they'll be more sad. They'll be um, low energy and a lot of those kinds of things. They may have preoccupation with the traumatic event, such as bringing up the episode about what happened um, significantly. And then they will seem incredibly stressed at times. So some family risk factors are maternal depression, um, substance abuse, parents with mental illness, domestic violence, kids that have to be in foster care because of neglect or abuse, poverty, adoption, and exposure to maltreatment. So I want to show you another video clip that kind of illustrates um, these. If you go to the Harvard Center for the Developing Child, there are a number of uh, video clips and print materials that are downloadable that are, when you're trying to help explain these things to other um, coworkers, parents, um, doing trainings for little study groups, um, just some excellent materials. And this is a, a super. Everyone in a community has a vested interest in everyone else's children because everyone else's children determine the next adult population that makes for a successful society. Built into our biology is the need to have responsive interactions with adults. Neglect for children is when they don't get what the brain is expecting to get, what the child is expecting to get, what we are biologically prepared and waiting for, which is input from those around us. It's this back and forth serve and return interaction that literally shapes the architecture of the brain. Serve and return begins when a child looks at something or observes something, makes an utterance, and that represents the serve. And the return is when the parent notices the child doing these things and responds to the child. Under conditions where serve and return is broken, you literally are pulling away the, what is the essential ingredient of the development of human brain architecture. It was a really compelling series of experiments where they started by videotaping the mother and the baby engaging in cooing and smiling. And then they asked the mother to basically put on a blank face and not respond at all. When a baby is not attended to, that is a sign of danger to the baby biologically. So the stress systems become activated. In a brain that is constantly bathed in stress hormones, not that's up and down, that comes with normal development, certain key synapses, the connections between nerves, fail to form, and critical regions of the brain. So neglect 
both fails to provide the stimulation that's needed to develop the basic architecture, and when it's at a certain level, is one of the most potent activators of the stress biology of a young child. So you get a double whammy. Science points to four categories of this spectrum of neglect. The first category would be what's called occasional inattention, where children experience responsiveness most of the time, but occasionally adults don't respond. There's no harm in that, and in fact, there's probably some benefit. A child can learn to self-soothe and explore the environment, and all of those opportunities build brain architecture. The second category, scientists would call chronic understimulation, is where on a regular basis, children have less interaction with the adults around them than is needed for healthy development. Those children typically, when provided with enriched learning opportunities and more typical levels of serve and return, will show catch up. The third category is what science would call severe neglect in a family where not only are there prolonged periods of inattention um, and lack of responsiveness, but often also associated with not being fed enough, not being bathed enough, not having basic needs met. Neglect is a huge problem in the U.S. Children are much more likely to be neglected than they are to experience any other kind of maltreatment. We see the child really being at risk for much more substantial kinds of deficits down the road that don't necessarily get easily fixed or ameliorated. This is where we really need to think about more complicated and often more intensive strategies to help undo those effects. The fourth category, called severe neglect, generally found in institutional settings, is the result of children living in kind of warehoused type situation in orphanages. And it doesn't have to even be as extreme as orphanages. It can be experiences that are regretfully occurring in many, many parts of our country. Often institutional care in this country is under the euphemistic name of transitional care or temporary care or assessment facilities. If you think about what institutional or residential care would look like for an infant, where there's somebody new coming on to the shift every eight hours. It really alters the development of the child's brain architecture and other aspects of the child's development. We have the potential to change children's developmental trajectories. Interventions can apply to parents, to foster parents or adoptive parents, child care settings, Head Start settings, and other kinds of settings. And really, what they're about is attuning people to the serve and return process. Neglecting young children is neglecting the foundations of, of a healthy next generation. The community pays a huge price later in terms of the problems of the next generation, whether it be educational achievement, economic productivity, good citizenship, the ability to parent the next generation. All of the things that have to do with a healthy, prosperous society. So we'll take just a minute and see if anybody has any questions or comments about anything so far. I like it better when I can see your faces and point at people and ask you what you think. <clears throat> you can just chat in the chat window. I don't think anybody's video, um, audio is enabled, so.
see some people typing some things, so we'll hang on just a second here. And then as we move forward, as you're thinking about things, go ahead and type in your questions. Um, and Charlie and Tracy will be monitoring those, and if there's overlap, they'll boil those down for me uh, at the end, too. And that way we don't have to wait for questions um, when we're ready to pause. So when these pop up, um, we'll kind of watch here. By the way, okay, let's look here. Yeah, those are good. Those are good questions. Okay, good. <clears throat> um, go ahead and kind of keep typing those. I'm going to go ahead and move forward. We'll save time and we'll kind of entertain some of those things. Um, so I want to go through a series of just kind of myths about um, infants and toddlers. Infants, infants don't have mental health. Um, the, the truth is um, they do, and we know that. Um, they show emotions. Um, they respond to comfort. They respond to the cues that we give them. But it's dependent upon how well we read their cues. And that's part of that serve and return interaction. Um, and babies are very responsive to people. Um, they're born with mental health and the capacity to be healthy, responsive, uh, happy uh, infants. And it continues to develop throughout life. Infants won't remember the negative experiences they have early in life. Um, the truth is, um, they're born ready for relationships. Um, and relationships they have give them the experiences that shape the architecture of the brain like we've been talking about um, and like the video clip talked about. And when they have those uh, experiences and those wonderful protective factors of good relationships, those help sustain them um, then across time. Uh, a third myth is infants are resilient and will easily recover from early adversity. Um, the truth is, while they're resilient, there's a threshold for how much they can repair. Um, when there's the more prolonged uh, the neglect or those adverse experiences are, the harder it is to bounce back. There's some limits to the resiliency of young children. Depends on are there, you can't have no stress life, but is the stress protected by enough healthy relationships to help them uh, be able to bounce back? Um, so some of your questions were, when they have some of that chronic stress, um, when we get them into good situations, um, we know that that can help them bounce back. Um, we need foster parents to connect with their foster children um, because that helps them connect with their birth parents and to help be able to support those things. Certainly appreciate how stressful it is. You see the infants come back um, often really stressed sometimes, and I know that really, can be really difficult. Um, and so it's good to have somebody that's helping to monitor that so you can kind of manage um, and understand how much of that uh, stress is present. And we'll, I'll look more specifically at some of those uh, questions. So the fourth myth is early experiences really don't count. It's what happens when they start school that really matters. And yet, just like we've talked, and you now realize that no, it's all of those early experiences are incredibly important. The brain develops incredibly rapid in those first years, and those positive um, serve and return interactions are critical. Um, there's a study by Kaiser Permanente called the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. Um, it's called the ACE Study, and that material is available on the internet. If you go to 
acestudy.org, acestudy.org, all of the published materials are there. Um, <clears throat> but we now know if you have three to four, that's kind of the, the tipping point where um, if you have, so then four or more, you're going to have more language delays, going to have more social emotional problems, uh, and a lot of significant uh, difficulties in, in terms of um, making it harder to bounce back. Um, we also know then that they studied adults in retrospect, and historically, those adults without mediation um, had more health problems, they smoked more, they had more risky life behaviors, um, they tended to have more drug and alcohol problems and obesity, cardiovascular, and autoimmune disorder uh, difficulties. Myth number five, it's not possible to recognize poor mental health during infancy. Um, it, it actually is very possible um, to recognize it. We have a lot of uh, markers and behaviors that we see. Um, you, you watch that still face and you see that baby get dysregulated when the mom turns away. And what that actually shows is there's an expectation from the baby that the mom's going to interact with me. And so when they do those cueing kinds of things, uh, parents will usually respond to those. And so when we work with children, when you see babies that are too quiet, too passive, um, or hyper dysregulated, they get upset and they can't soothe and regulate, those are warning signs that something is, is out of balance and we probably need to be taking a look at those kinds of things. Um, so we have a lot of knowledge and tools, um, some that are informal, some that are more formal, um, but there's a number um, of things that, that we can teach people to help recognize those things. Myth number six, um, infants and toddlers who experience neglect and or abuse are getting the help they need to address their mental health um, needs. The truth is, um, we often don't monitor, we don't know what, what people don't, haven't been trained to know what they're looking for. Um, we know that there has been an absence of people trained um, to deal with, uh, particularly under five. Um, we now have had a good response from our uh, insurance providers and they readily um, are working with clinicians like myself and others. Um, to do appropriate mental health interventions. Um, <clears throat> we're trying to do um, activities like this, and there's a huge push across the state to educate people about warning signs and just what are really good um, interventions, parenting, how do we support parents um, in these efforts. Pediatric offices are screening not only for physical developmental markers, but also social-emotional uh, markers. And, but, but more needs to be done, and, and um, one step at a time, but we're getting there. Uh, myth number seven, early mental health does not impact mental health later in life, and as we've been talking about, um, we know that it does. Um, the more adverse experiences they have, um, the more challenging the trajectory for that child is through uh, the rest of their life. <clears throat> Excuse me. Myth number eight, um, whatever adversity a child may have experienced before school can be undone by school age programs. Um, we, we see this host of children, unsocialized children, arriving um, at kindergarten um, that they're already behind. They're hyper aroused, they're dysregulated. Um, and having an extremely hard time. We're having it, we're, the schools are having a very hard time um, helping those kids grow and, and be more regulated. So, um, so the challenge is how do we work systematically um, rather than wait to meet those kids' needs earlier? As we know those kids 
didn't show up and just have problems on the first day of kindergarten. <clears throat> we can't change the past, but um, schools try to do as much mental health kinds of things they can, but when we can actively be more mindful and screen systematically earlier for mental health kinds of things, in our teach our daycare centers what, what to look for. So this idea of infant mental health, infant, toddler, early childhood mental health doesn't belong just to me as a psychologist. It belongs to all of us. Um, I have a set of skills um, that are not dissimilar to what you all can do. Um, we can teach you to read and recognize relationship kinds of things. I can help the more um, severe the needs come, but I can help all of us by doing this kind of thing and helping us be aware and teaching about serve and return interactions and oh honey look it, she's cueing you that she needs to, to have you pick her up and comfort her right now. Um, I'm really excited about Circle of Security Parenting and I'm going to show you um, an introductory clip from that because that's one of the things that we can, in, we can, we can create a movement as a state and it's happening around the country um, and there's other models using those kinds of good early childhood mental health attachment ideas about serve and return and how do we support those types of interactions. Okay, let me see where I'm at. So we're talking about changing our knowledge about mental health and how it starts early. You know, it's it's not just uh, adult concept, it's a, it's a womb to tomb kind of thing. Um, how, how do our policies reflect early identification of mental health um, kinds of things? We've got a ways to go, but we've made some good advances in Nebraska related to how we um, approach early childhood services, uh, which is beginning to include more and more um, social emotional development. Um, but we also have to be mindful of our own beliefs about in terms of adult child, parent child interactions, what are the kinds of things that support healthy um, interactions and, and infant mental health. Most people do not realize that for too many, poor mental health begins during the first three years and sets a child on a path that can be riddled with mental health challenges. Um, but we're starting to make some progress in helping change that. So we can work together uh, with families to understand mental health needs of not only the child, but it's not, it's not just the child especially infants. When we talk about infant mental health, it's about the relationship and it's about the quality of those serve and return interactions. It's about the dyad and the relationship. Um, so we can talk about creating plans that help us deal with risk factors and vulnerabilities. We can understand the protective factors that help protect and minimize neglect and abuse kinds of things. And it's it's all of us. It's not any one of us that's going to make a difference. Early intervention is the key. Collaborating with pediatrics, other medical providers, providers to help with screening and to help emphasize early intervention. Um, <clears throat> working as early intervention teams to find mental health providers who work with this population or maybe have an interest who would partner with you to help go to trainings um, who would um, do a little mini in services for small parent groups and different kinds of things. Um, there's a lot of things that happen around those kind of efforts um, that can be built upon. Uh, we need to monitor the child's development, provide good developmental guidance to parents, grandparents, particularly these areas of social emotional guidance. Um, challenge belief systems about spanking young children. Um, there's still a lot of beliefs about, oh, you're going to spoil that baby, and, and we know that you can't spoil a baby. A ba uh, spoiling is about not being able to say no to children. 
we, we know the research supports now that if when an infant cries, if we respond to that infant in a mindful way and help them soothe, that helps those neuronal pathways in the brain be very strong and over time the those create the neural templates in the brain that, oh, well, when I'm upset, somebody always comes. So um, they'll be here in a little bit, which is the beginning of that self-soothing types of, of kinds of things. Um, and so it's that balance of eventually the child's able to have um, somebody always comes so I know I can wait rather than I don't want the child who never got any comfort and so they push anybody away when they're upset versus the child that got too much comfort as they aged and they got taught that they can't regulate at all and they can't organize any feelings without adult support. So there's this constant ongoing um, balance. And this, this need to remind policymakers how important social emotional intervention impacts school readiness. And it's linked to um, academic outcomes as we get into school age kinds of things. Um, so school boards need to be aware of this kind of information or local communities. Um, this graph talks about um, let's get my pointer out here. You, you have traumatic experiences and those um, an example might be one parent is an abuser um, and there was parent, parent death and there's these pr protective factors like aunts, uncles, other relationships, good healthy things that surround them that may minimize those kinds of things. In this instance, we have other families step in to provide help um, and that can be very protective um, over time. In situations like this, a mother dies, the father's emotionally vulnerable and there's no one else to help well, those are limited or weak protective factors, and that leads to the baby is distressed and doesn't have those reparative types of healthy supports, and that can lead then to very poor outcomes over time. So trauma, trauma or toxic stress um, affects brain development overall development, relationship and attachment, and general overhaul physical health as well. So what's your role in understanding a child's development? Um, you know, we're not asking people to diagnose, but we're asking people to have good observation skills about what are you seeing and can you um, work in your systems to create a developmental screening process that includes social and emotional kinds of things, um, partnerships with uh, families and foster families. Um, teach yourself to be good observers of those serve and return parent-child interactions. Um, be mindful of when those kinds of trainings are being offered so that you know how to use some of those tools if it's appropriate for your role. You can reach out to the Early Development Network, which is um, based in Nebraska through the education system. And it is the child find process if kids have developmental delays, which includes um, social emotional concerns. The children can be assessed and may qualify um, for different kinds of services. Um, and there's, um, well, be talking more about that in future webinars as well. Um, so um, back to this idea of poor mental health can impact long-term outcomes. We know that when young children experience poor mental health, the impact is also on that physical well-being piece. And um, I've talked about that. So here's an example of some data that's been kind of extrapolated to apply adverse childhood experiences and how that might look like in a typical classroom using Nebraska data. 
So this would be 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, um, 14 kids out of 30 would have no adverse childhood experiences. 1 to 2 adverse childhood experiences. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. Um, 4 would have 3 to 4 adverse childhood experiences. And greater, 5 or greater, would have 2 adverse childhood experiences. That really is quite significant when you think about it. So a typical classroom has about six kids that are going to have significant stressors related to those types of adverse childhood experiences. So we need to be aware and monitor for warning signs. We need to realize that all of those connections count. Every moment counts in a child's life. Um, that you see just by watching that still face, when the mom puts on a still face, that causes a child to be dysregulated. Now, part of that is the normal coming and going of parent-childhood interactions. But when we are not aware of that and we end up being gone, chronically gone, then that ends up being incredibly adversive um, to children. What kinds of things are we already doing and how can we be aware of those? We need to educate ourselves and advocate for children, you know, get involved in our communities, talk to school administrators, hospital administrators, the judges, lawyers, your school you know, your preschool teams, early childhood teams, and really um, emphasize the type, types of needs for children. Um, I want to talk just a little bit more about um, relationships. And a model that's incredibly helpful is the circle of security model. Um, and it, it talks about um, parents as the hands. And, and children, as soon as they can move, have this need to go out into the world and explore. And we need to be able to support that. But kids always have this need to come back to get their emotional cup filled up. And so but we don't just let them explore and not know where they are. We need to watch over them. We need to help them when they need a little help. Um, and then they may want to enjoy doing something with us. Um, but then there's always that delight we talked about when we were looking at those uh, photos of parents and children beginning. Um, but then they need to come back and they may just want to come back to get their battery charged, their emotional cup filled up. They may be a bit frightened and they need protection. Or they may just need, again, that delight because the delight, in, especially in infancy and early childhood, is that glue that binds us. It's a big important part of the attachment relationship in that serve and return interaction piece. And when that's missing, that's another risk factor. We don't see delight in parent-child interactions. We know we have a problem that we can help support. If you think about maternal depression as a risk factor, if a mom is depressed and having trouble responding to these needs on the top of the circle, we call it, and on the bottom of the circle, then kids learn to not expect to get their needs met. <clears throat> and then the last need that's been identified in this model is the organize my feelings piece and how important it is to co-regulate to help children in their be their ability to self-soothe and self-regulate so I want to show you this video clip um, it's an introductory video clip it's four minutes from the circle of security that just kind of um, gives a few basics of this model um, there's some educators around the state. We have 14 in the panhandle. 
Um, there will be a training to be a parent, a circle of security parent educator in September. Um, so if anybody might be interested in that, you could contact one of us and we can tell you more about that. Welcome to Circle of Security Parenting, a relationship-based parenting program developed by Kent Hoffman, Glenn Cooper, and Bert Powell, three of the originators of the internationally acclaimed Circle of Security. It is best to begin learning about the Circle of Security knowing it is about all of us and each of us. The Circle began at the beginning of life and will continue throughout life, all through time, and in every place around the world. As you will soon find out, the more secure your child is, the more she or he will be able to enjoy you, have higher self-esteem, and the confidence to turn to you in times of trouble, both now and all the way into those difficult teenage years. Based on decades of attachment research, the Circle of Security was created as a simple graphic to make this everyday coming and going within relationship easy for all of us to recognize. We'll start with a very basic tour of the circle, and then, as we travel together over time, we'll add a few extra pieces to the circle. Let's start with the hands that you see on the circle. It's always important to remember that we are those hands. We are the secure base that gives our children the sense of safety they need to step out on the circle and discover the world. Of course, children soon need to return. We are also the safe haven they come into when they need reconnection. It's as if they're filling their emotional cup. When their cup is full, they are ready to venture right back out on the circle for another round. With each new round, our relationship grows stronger and our child feels increasingly secure. When you don't understand like why your ch child's going out and you're really scared or when your child's coming in and you're like really annoyed or irritated, it's just good to know that the circle is like about the circle because then you're knowing why they're coming to you or why they're going out and you can support them in both directions. It wasn't anything that I had ever heard of. It was just something totally different that just clicked in my mind with um, seeing seeing how the kids go around the circle with exploring and with coming back um, in for comfort or you know whatever it is that they need. <laughs> the circle helps me have a picture of what's happening that's happening all the time. The circle taught me to be able to look and see my child's needs. So on the top, she was going out to explore, and they usually go out to explore, and you know, they want you to delight in their exploration, and then they usually come back to you. I didn't know that. There is much more to learn about the needs that children have as they go around the circle of security. For now, you may want to watch for the circle with your children, as well as looking for how it shows up with the children of friends and neighbors. I can support that now. I'm confident that my son is coming back to me. I can watch him exploring and being out where he needs to be, and I can be there when he comes back. I mean, I could really, I could really see how it could work with, with me and, and my daughter and, you know, even other kids that, that I deal with, you know, with my own parenting or I used to work in childcare and, you know, it was never really talked about in that kind of way. And I think it would be totally cool if people, more people were involved in it. Once you can see it, you may be surprised to find that the circle of security is already playing a central role in the life of every child you meet. So I want to um, kind of look at these questions a little bit and entertain some of those.
Okay, good questions. Um, that the question about <clears throat> that foster kids who's with their biological parents four to seven hours and then um, in the foster home 14 months um, yeah the, one of the things to know about attachment is attachment is relationship specific uh, and so we have interactions where we can watch and observe relationships and see how kids relate to uh, a mom, a dad, a foster dad, a foster mom, a grandparent, and we'll get clues about how well, how safe does that child feel um, with the very the different people. So when I do relationship assessments with parents and children to help inform that process, I also like to see what's happening with the foster parents because that helps me know what's going on with the child in terms of how um, how intact their ability to form relationships is. Um, and, and so that's why it's really important for foster parents to be responsive, caring. And so, yeah, they can um, differentiate between that and know um, I'm safe here and I'm becoming safe here. And when foster parents can help children and say, you know, you're going to go see mom and dad today. And, you know, it's help set the stage for that with the expectation that yes they are going to be where you're going to be that helps the repair of those relationships actually happen when when they can happen we know sometimes it can't but um, families can grow more than we want to believe they can lots of times um, if you have a follow-up to that you can type it in and I'll, I'll I'll try and respond to it, but I'm going to go on to the next one here. Um, I think the chronic understimulation could happen in what, what most people consider normal, happy family. You, you are exactly right, and that, that is a concern for all of us. If you think about um, <clears throat> what do we do around at home? You sit at the dinner table, and people are on their cell phones. Um, the TV's on. People are on all of their electronics. Um, and these are pretty healthy, functioning families, and yet we're not mindful of the importance of that circle and meeting kids' needs. Um, and we're, we're not only impacted by all of the stress of the day-to-day -day life, but we bring to the table our own history. And if I wasn't, as a child, a person who got my needs met well, and got my feelings organized by having parents be with me around joy, curiosity, sadness, shame, anger, and fear, I'm going to have a harder time doing that with my kids. And, and if I can't be with all of those emotions on the top of the circle and on the bottom of the circle, that's also a pretty significant risk factor for having um, children that have what we would call secure attachment. What the research shows is that only 50 to 60 percent of the population have secure attachment. And that's, that's not a diagnosis in the, like the diagnostic manual. That's just um, some of us are more insecure in our relationships because of the quality of the caregiving we got as infants and young ch in, in our early childhood. Um, on the other hand, it's important to realize that um, we, you can earn secure in relationships. So when you become able to understand that, you reflect on your history, you, um, if you need to, you do some counseling, you talk to other people, you begin to recognize that, oh, I'm the adult, I need to respond to my children. Um, I can override my discomfort about being a parent to help meet my kids' needs, which is a really healthy thing to do. And that's one of the very powerful aspects of the circle of security, that the, second, the first half kind of introduces the circle and teaches the needs, and it's all video-based with those clips, so it's actual real-life parent interactions. 
The second half really talks about that kind of stuff I was just talking about and how, to, how do we help um, recognize my own um, capacity and the, the problems that may interfere with me being with my kids when I really need to be with them. I have a little girl on my caseload that was removed from a math house at six months. She was given back to the biological mother. She's now over three and does not talk. She's withdrawn and resists attempts to interact with her. What are some things we can do with her in a preschool setting? Um, you know, teaching the procedures, um, kind of assessing for, she probably it would be at risk to have a lot of uh, sensory problems, um, probably more emotional regulation problems. Um, with the methamphetamines, there's often exposure to alcohol. Not always, but um, a lot of times there are. Um, and the alcohol can be as bad or worse than the methamphetamines sometimes. Um, they, you know there's some risk for attachment concerns because the attachment window is from 6 to 24 months in terms of the critical sensitivity in terms of brain development. Um, and sometimes kids are placed back uh, without helping facilitate those serve and return interactions. Um, so order and routine, consistency, trying to encourage um, some gentle touch, um, hand massage, um, lots of those kinds of things. Um, and I think you'll get a few more ideas over time if you participate in the other uh, webinars as well. Um, and that would be a great topic for a, a future one as well. Are the long-term effects of neglect in an institutional care have more impact than in home due to the constant change of caregivers? Yes. Um, because when you don't have that consistent caregiving, um, the babies, they can't predict what's going to happen. Who's going to be there? Whose smells am I going to have? Um, and predictability is one of those important things that leads to um, patterned, repetitive types of interactions, which are those responsive serve and return interactions that lead to the best and uh, strongest brain development in all of those areas. Um, in, in like Romanian orphanages, <clears throat> places like those where you've got those chronic institutional situations, um, lots of times the kids don't get held and they don't get their need for physical touch met either, which is um, really critical. Um, that that's, we have a need for physical touch. Um, to give you an idea of this window, this critical window, they've, they've done studies looking at kids adopted by age two versus kids adopted out of those orphanages by um, five, um, you know, five or six, and they looked at just cognitive functioning, not, not even the social emotional part of it. But kids adopted by age six had a mean IQ of 85, which if, if the average is 100, um, and then those are chunked in groups of 15. So um, 85 is at the bottom end of average. 85 to 100 is um, the average. 80, 85 to 115 is the average range. So the mean 50th percentile is 100. Um, then kids adopted by age 2 had a mean IQ of 100, which is right at the mean. And that, that's because they got that better um, consistency, serve and return interaction, um, got held, got rocked, got sung to, so their language skills were better, their self-regulation skills were better, and all of those things um, were significantly improved. Just because they were out of that um, chronic, um, less stimulating environment without there ever being any types of abuse kinds of things, 
they just didn't get the stimulation that they that they need. It, it, an, in another study related to that, there was um, when they were looking at these this data, there was one floor that had was having consistently better results with those later adopted kids. And as they began to try and figure that out, what they discovered was one of the night cleaning ladies couldn't stand it that these kids were not getting held and loved and kissed. And she was systematically um, on breaks and in between mopping floors and cleaning and stuff. She would hold these kids and sing to them and love them up uh, during her shift. It's quite a remarkable story. Um, but a significant testament to the power of uh, relationship resiliency that the healing comes you know, the damage happens in the absence or context of poor relationships, but healing happens in the context of healthy relationships. Um, so when, I, when we work with little kids in terms of intensive interventions, it's seldom alone. It's got to be in the context of the relationships with the people that uh, love them and take care of them. Okay, so for a parent who has a child with medical issues and the needs and needs multiple medical interventions and they're awake and the parent is present, does the child associate the parent with the trauma of that experience since they're not rescuing from that pain? Well, I <clears throat> boy, that's a that's a hard question. I I think that um, part of that's how it gets happen how it gets handled because kids need to know the story and the pa the story about what's happening and I the more depending on their age they can be informed about what's happening and that I'm here to help keep you safe I know this hurts um, it hurts because um, you know it's like the ludicrousness of telling a kid a shot isn't gonna hurt you know we we just teach them that we're gonna lie to them and then bad things happen um, it's, it's okay to so there's going to be a little stick, but it'll, it'll hurt for a minute and then it'll be over. That's a better way to handle those things. Um, when kids react to that, you can, or you see them playing it out, or they're angry, you know, and you think you can link it to those things, you can say things like, um, gosh, I, you know, that was really hard today, wasn't it? And I wonder if you're kind of upset with me that I let the doctor do those things that kind of hurt you today. Um, so part of it is in helping them understand the story of what happened, happened and then tuning into the idea, part of attunement, which is an important part of the attachment process and having healthy serve and return relationships, is tuning into what's going on with children and realizing that behavior has a story. Um, because if a kid is having some misbehavior in response to some, some of those things sometimes, and we just stop the behavior without helping them understand or, or stopping to reflect and think ourselves about um, those things, then uh, we aren't helping to discharge the problem that's going on. Yeah, if they're pre-verbal, you can still talk to them because if you think about a nine-month-old, they can still process. There's been studies that show they process a lot more receptively than we realize they can. Um, I have a nine-month-old grandson, and I know he processes all kinds of information because they're teaching him sign, and they'll give him some food, and he'll eat finger food a few things, and they'll say, you want some more, and you'll see him go like this, indicating he wants more. So. Young kids can process a lot more even though they're still at that pre-verbal stage. And the other thing that happens is the, the body remembers everything. Um, so when there's, there's trauma kinds of things, um, even though they may not be able to verbally talk about it, it will come out in stress responses. Um, sometimes it comes out in delayed responses. You'll see kids playing it out later. Um, there's even been some uh, anecdotal evidence that sometimes fetus have memories too. I, a national play therapist that I consult with talked about a session he was observing and the parents happened to be watching the session and the child 
was doing a doctor's kit kind of play and um, it was dark and there was a flashlight and there was a proby like thing and mom was standing there and she went um, the, the psychologist asked what do you think that might be about and and she said I think you know I had an amnio uh, procedure when I was pregnant with him and there's a little there's a light process in that and it's just interesting kinds of things I've had play sessions where I was pretty sure the child like a three four year old child had put me in uh, the role of being hurt as an infant and was standing over me um, screaming at me and he took a like a we I keep some plastic bags in the playroom for um, just shopping play and things like that and they held it over my face and I thought I, I had this overwhelming feeling that I was an infant and being screamed at for crying too much and with a pillow over my face and I knew enough about the child's history that I kind of knew that that was very likely in this kid's uh, situation did not go back to the parents the parents are in jail and those kinds of situations but you know part of that is then you work with the kids to help them understand um, you're not hurting them on purpose this is how we help you make it better I'm sorry it hurts and we're gonna keep you safe so that you can be healthy over the long haul that was probably way more than you wanted but it got me thinking about a lot of different kinds of things related to that so what else folks I know that maybe Tracy wants to say a few things and well, do you have other questions comments Oh, that's a hard one. Um, I think in the first, <clears throat> I think you gotta gotta think about what does that mean. Um, one of the things that, and you gotta understand what's what's why is why is the child crying and dysregulated? Are they teething? Are they in pain? Um, at seven to nine, ten months. Object, object permanent starts and so you start to get separation anxiety and are you gonna just let them cry it out or are you gonna reassure them that you're still there for them and help them co-regulate um, I'm not a big cry it out kind of person I think you have to do it mindfully you know two or three minutes um, is different than crying it out for a long time but I mean part of that is the support of coming and going and saying I know you're okay maybe soothing them with a little touch laying them back down um, you know part of that is you got to know your kid and and be able to um, I know sleep is important too so um, I don't think any children um, I, I just worry based on what I know and from an attachment perspective you got to be really careful with cry it out um, I consult with a pediatrician here in Scotts Bluff who um, we kind of uh, are having an ongoing conversation about some of that so that's a good question and you need to read and inform yourself and um, just keep thinking about it You're welcome. Well, the the screen thing is a huge problem. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics actually has a published white paper um, that talks about um, kids under two should not have any screen time. They have 
I haven't read it yet. I've, I've heard about it. They have modified that a bit um, because there's some research coming out that shows the touch screens, iPads, and the Android systems, if it's a good instructional uh, material um, with, and it's not just letting them do it. If it's done in the context of relationship and interactive, some of that is good under two. Um, after age two, they only recommend no more than two hours a day of total screen time. Um, when kids are in front of screens all the time, they don't live in a three-dimensional problem-solving wor world where there's face-to-face, um, -face serve and return interactions. And I hope you've kind of gotten the idea that what I do impacts my brain. It actually changes the neuronal development in the brain. And so if all you're doing is sitting, playing video games and interacting, you're not ready to participate in a classroom setting where you have to engage, listen to a teacher, turn to your neighbor, um, solve problems, interact, and, and do paper pencil tasks and all of those kinds of things. Okay. Tracy. Hello. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Hey everyone, this is Tracy. Um, Petra McCormick. I'm in Omaha. Um, I am uh, also on the board of the um, Nebraska Association of Infant Mental Health, and I wanted to thank everybody for participating tonight. Um, like Mark said, this is one of our first little adventures, and we're really excited about it. We're really excited about the number of participants we've gotten tonight. Um, I want to just make a couple statements about the importance of the surveys um, and, and ask that you take just a couple minutes to complete those when this is done. I also want to um, give a shout out to our Facebook page. So anybody who's on Facebook and is interested, go ahead and search us on there and like our page. We put a lot of literature out there, um, notices for trainings and those sorts of things. We really welcome um, discussion around anything that's going on across our state, lots of updates. We want to know and really be a hub for a place for people across the state of Nebraska to know what's going on in each other's communities, share ideas, successes, and really be able to use one another. So we really want that to be a place of connection and communication. Um, the other thing is uh, we're in the middle of a membership drive, so we're really trying to encourage folks to join um, the board and really work uh, and, and become part of that greater community. Some of the perks that you get from being a member is you do get a, a literature packet. Um, you'll have notices of training and uh, community events across the state that are going to enhance any sort of education and and training around this topic. Um, and we really want to hear another another thing I, I want to share is any topics that you guys feel um, we could bring to you. What kind of trainings do you need? What kind of research are you looking for? What kind of applications are you needing to really enhance the work that you're doing in whatever discipline um, you're working in? We want to know what you guys need so that we can bring it to you. So thanks again for joining us tonight. We hope to see you for the next five. I hope this was helpful to you. Uh, we appreciate your feedback and for joining us. Um, if I can be of any assistance to you, I'll give you my email. It's haldibaldi at gmail.com. I'll put that in the window so you can see it. And thank you all so much. Um, please do the survey. And if, does anybody have any final questions? I'll let Charlie answer that question. Um, yes. Uh, 
we would like you to register for each uh, webinar so that we have a head count basically to make sure that uh, we have, uh, uh, technology to support the number of uh, people that we have on the actual webinar. So it will be at the same address. So that would be great. Um, the survey will be, you will be redirected at the close of the webinar to the survey. Thank you, everyone, and appreciate you, your time, taking out time, and see you in a month.